Well, thank you for joining us here at Grace Communion Hanover. I'm Chip Rockmeyer, the associate pastor here, and we are, meet at 7300 Hanover Green Drive in Old Town Mechanicsville. So today I'm going to be talking about the subject of repentance. What does it mean when the Bible speaks of repentance? Now, many people think that repentance Think of repentance as ceasing from sin. And you've probably been told or maybe told yourself, if you had really repented, you wouldn't have done that bad thing again. And we are told that repentance is to turn around and go the other way. And it is often explained in the context of turning away from sin and turning toward a life of obedience to God's law. And with that idea firmly in mind, many Christians set out with the best of intentions to change their ways. And some ways change. But some ways seem to stick like super glue. <laughs> and even what does change often has a nasty way of coming back again and plaguing us again. So then many assume that, well... Maybe they really haven't repented or that their repentance wasn't deep enough or heartfelt. Well, brethren, folks, I have good news for you. The good news is is that repentance towards God is simply not about a new and improved you. Jesus talks, exhorts us to repent. He did that in Mark 1 in verse 14, near the beginning of his ministry. Mark 1 and, and actually verse 15, he says, The time has come, he said, the kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. Repent and believe the good news. Repentance and faith mark the beginning of our new life in the kingdom of God. But they don't mark it because we did the right thing. They mark it because that is when the scales start to fall off of our eyes and we at last see the light of truth in Jesus. Understand this, everything that is needed to be done for our salvation and forgiveness has already been done by Jesus Christ. Jesus has done that. There was a time when we were in the dark about that. You know, we thought we had to strive for perfection and obey the law in order to gain salvation. But the good news is that Jesus paid the price for all our sins. He saved us. He washed us. He cleansed us in righteousness and set a place for us at his eternal banquet table. When by the grace of God we come to understand that and see it and believe it, that is when we have repented. Repentance is a change of how we think. It is a change of our perspective from seeing ourselves as the center of the universe to seeing God as the center of the universe and trusting God with our life and his mercy. Repentance is not about promises to be good. It's trusting God to have mercy on you. It's trusting God to be who he says he is for you. He says he's our savior, he's our teacher, he's our sanctifier. Let's look in 1 John 4. 1 John 4, and starting in verse 9. It says, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. And this is love, 
not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Yes, Jesus was sent as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. God loves us for who we are, his beloved child in Christ. Not for what we have, have, not for what we have done, not for the way we look. He loves us because we are his children. All our failures are redeemed and made right in Christ's death and resurrection. Your eternal future is assured. You belong to God. God loves you. He likes you. He loves you for Christ's sake. So with that, in Romans 8, Romans 8, starting in verse 1, he says, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit of life set me free. For the law of sin and death set me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do, in that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in sinful man in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the sinful nature but according to the Spirit. So repentance is turning to God to be for you what you could never be for yourself. To do for you what you could never do for yourself. It's about trusting God to be your righteousness. Not about doing better yourself. It's trusting God to be your righteousness. When we repent, we are not gearing up for some massive assault on sin. We are coming to Christ for rest. Jesus talked about a rest and he encouraged us to just come to him. Matthew 11. Matthew 11 and verse 28. He says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, And learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. We can find rest in Jesus. Not in striving, trying to be a better person. No, we just come to Jesus. He is our righteousness. Jesus is our rest. We can rest in Jesus because he's forgiven us of our sins. And he is our righteousness. We can rest in him because we are trusting him to be our all in all. Instead of having to rely on our good deeds. God forgives all our sins. All of them. Past, present. And future. God did not wait until we were becoming better before He removed our sins through Jesus. He forgave us long ago. Romans 5 in verse 8, He says, But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners. God is not waiting for us to 
give an I'm sorry speech or something like that in order to forgive us. He's forgiven us long ago. Long ago. While we were still sinners. He's forgiven all mankind. So repentance is not a first step for prompting God to forgive us. He's already done it. Repentance is coming to believe that God has already forgiven us. It is believing the truth that he has saved us and given us eternal life. When you trust in God for forgiveness and salvation, you have repented. This new way of thinking is the way of trusting God to do what you could never do for yourself. Repentance is not a change from moral imperfection to moral perfection. We are incapable of moral perfection because the fact is (laughs) we're dead. That's right, we are dead. Ephesians 2, in Paul's message to the Ephesians, he talks about this concept of us being dead. Ephesians 2 and verse 4. He says, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. That's right, we were dead in transgressions, but God made us alive in Christ. And he said, it is by grace you have been saved. So being dead was what we contributed to this process. That's what we contributed. We were dead. And you know, dead people don't really do anything. (laughs) They're just dead. You know, we were dead in our sins, but Christ has made us alive. He did everything. Jesus did everything. We did nothing. But you know, it's only dead people that can be resurrected from the dead. (laughs) And that's exactly... Is, is what's going on with our life in Christ. You know, Jesus gave parables to emphasize certain points, to emphasize certain truths. And a series of parables he gave is found in Luke 15, where he talks about the lost sheep, the lost coin, And the prodigal son. Let's take a look at that here in in Luke 15. Starting in verse 1. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear him. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the, na- in, in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. So Jesus equates this story here with repentance. But what did this lost sheep do? <laughs> the only thing it did was get lost. <laughs> Jesus, you know, the the shepherd, went and found the lost sheep. Again, the the sheep, that one lost sheep, that's the only thing it did was get lost. Jesus went and sought it, found it, put it on its shoulders, and brought it home. 
Let's look at the, the parable of the lost coin that follows. Here in verse 9, Or suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Does she not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. He's again equating that lost coin with repentance. What did that coin do? All it did was get lost. It didn't wave its hand and say, Hey, I'm over here. I'm over here. Come get me. No, it was just lost. And the lady who lost the coin, she went and found it. And what about the parable, the prodigal son, or in some pericopes it has the parable of the lost son? You know, that son, he came back, and really before he could get his, you know, his whole speech that he had prepared out, his father had already forgiven him before he even said a word. His father came running when he saw him off, in the distance, the father went running towards him, not out of anger, but out of love. He had forgiven his son, and as soon as that son came back, he said, you know, bring the best robe, put it on him, this, the ring, let's have a feast, a celebration, because my son who was lost is now found. No. These examples are of repentance. And again, the sheep, the coin, the son, they were, they were all lost. The father figure in each of these parables did everything. And, and that's what God does with us through Jesus Christ. Repentance is not bringing forth some good and noble work or mouthing some emotion-laden speech to prompt God to forgive us. It's not like that. There's absolutely nothing we are capable of doing that could add anything to our being made alive already in Jesus Christ. Repentance is just a simple matter of believing God's good news and forgiveness and redemption in Jesus to believe the good news that God has washed you clean in the blood of Christ, that he has he's healed you from your deadness and made you alive forevermore in his son is to repent. Now some will say that repentance towards God will result in good morals and good behavior. Of course it does. When you know that you are loved, that you are saved, that you are forgiven by your loving Father, that just prompts an automatic response to, to live like your Father. It, it's just an automatic response. But trying to measure repentance by the absence or presence of good behavior is to totally misunderstand repentance. It's coming to accept, repentance is coming to accept God's forgiveness, that God has accomplished everything for our salvation through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. So the point of repentance is a change of heart from seeing ourselves as number one to viewing God as being number one in our lives. Trust God. Rest in Jesus. Repent and believe the good news. That is the message of repentance. 
believe what God has already done for each of our salvation through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. That's good news, brethren. It's not about us trying to get on that hamster wheel and trying to do good things in order for God to forgive us. He's already forgiven us. Be thankful for that. Rest in Jesus. Well, today we're going to uh, pass out communion as we typically do and partake of the, the bread and wine, the bread symbolizing Christ's body and the wine symbolizing his shed blood. So we can go ahead and start to do that. As we we're doing that, I'm just going to quote from 1 Corinthians. Where Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, excuse me, 11, verse 25. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So that's what we're doing in the, the sacraments here of the, the bread and wine. We're proclaiming the Lord's death. That act of salvation for all mankind. Does everybody have their elements? Okay, so we'll partake of the bread, symbolizing, symbolizing Christ's body. And the wine symbolizing his shed blood. Well, if you'd like to support what we're doing here at Grace Communion Hanover, we would welcome your support. You can text to give. You can text uh, to 804-409-0445. Uh, real easy on your cell phone. Just uh, go to that number and real easy to give. And we appreciate your financial offerings. It helps us keep the lights on, uh, employ a full-time pastor, Pastor Bill Wynn, and support his family and to cover the rent here of our facility. So thank you for joining us today. I hope you have a good rest of the weekend. Try and stay cool and rest in Jesus. <laughs>